name of Jesus that we can go forward with whatever we're dealing with in our life. Whether it's uh, he just wants to be there to be our friend and we share with him like he's our friend. Just like you would call somebody up on the phone and say, listen, you take what's happening. That's the same way we want to communicate with our Lord. And he allows them. It's a beautiful name that we call upon. You are the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory and creation, now revealed in you, my Christ. What a beautiful name.
Christmas gifts up here on the stage are a reminder that next uh, Sunday evening at 6.30, or at 6 o'clock actually, uh, over in the Family Life Center, we will have our Christmas in August. I saw that there were a church or two that beat us to the punch this year to Christmas in August. We had always been first, but uh, nobody does it better than Charlotte First Baptist Church. So bring your, your gifts. We have bring your food. There's a sign of sheet, several that are around um, with various things that we need that evening. It's always fun. I look forward to that event. Did we have it last year? I think we did. Thank you. This year for that, we had this one here. But thank you for that. Also, if you're going to the uh, Bill Spears luncheon on September 4th, I need you to let me know by next Sunday uh, about this time. I'm the one that's keeping the list for Angie Kaplan in Florida. Uh, I'll get her through that afternoon. We have a good group right now coming. So if you are coming and you haven't told me yet, uh, please let me know and I'll put you on the list as far as the either via the Full moon barbecue from from the uh, That's that's a nice lunch and I get that. So let's tell Bill how much we love him, how much we appreciate him at his 91st, I think it is, birthday party. Is it not? Oh, that's right, 95. Wow. Is he the oldest person around here? Hmm. I think he is. God bless the man. God bless you all. To Samuel. It's our lesson today. Second Samuel chapter five. We're going to read this chapter together. Follow along as I read David. This is a turning point. This is a big deal. Uh, we're now done with the wilderness wanderings of David. David is in Hebrew. David is coming to Jerusalem. Things are changing. He is things are happening in his life. And we learn about it in chapter 5. To Samuel. Chapter 5 again in verse 1. And all the tribes of Israel came to David and Hebrew and said, We are your flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David and Hebrew, King made a covenant with Hebrew before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and reigned 40 years in Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, You will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off, O God. David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, which is the city of David. On that day, David had said, Anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the watershed to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. That is why they say the blind, the blind and the lame will not enter this place. David, they took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. He built up the area around it from the terraces inward and he became more and more powerful because the Lord Almighty was with him. A hiring king of Tyre sent envoys to David along with cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons and they built palace for David. Then David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. After he left Hebron, David took more concubines and wives in Jerusalem, and more sons and daughters were born to him. These are the names of the children born to him there. Shemuah, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ephar, Elisha, Nephed, Japhia, Elishama, Eliada, and Elipheleth. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him, but David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephidim. So David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? 
The Lord answered him, Go, and I will surely deliver the Philistines into your hand. So David went to the Al Harazim, and there he defeated them. He said, As waters break out, the Lord has broken out against my enemies before me. So that place was called the Al Harazim. Philistines abandoned their idols there, and David and his men carried them off. Once more, Philistines came up and spread out in the valley of Rehoboth. So David inquired of the Lord, and he answered, Do not go straight up, but circle around them, behind them, attack them in front of the poplar trees. Soon as you hear the sound of marching on the tops, of the poplar trees move quickly because that will mean that the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. So David did as the Lord commanded him and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gideon to Gezer. May, Lord, may the Lord this morning bless the reading of this holy word. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this powerful word, I pray that it be powerful in our hearts, something more than merely hearing the ears, but that there be a spiritual discernment of your voice in each person here today to hear your word to each of us. Each individual in Corporate Church may be here and live by, obey, and prosper and be winners because of the word of God. Thank you for these that have gathered here today. I pray now, speak to us, Holy Spirit, for us. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. It's not going to take us long in our study to discover that uh, David, well, um, we haven't seen much of this so far, but David has some issues. <laughs> and, and in fact, in many ways, uh, David is a good example that we preach on in ministry about what it means to be a, a he can be a loser at times but we ain't seeing none of it here in chapter 5 we see David at the of his ministry of his kingship and we get a picture not of a loser here in chapter we're going to talk first of all about what it means when we look at David and we see someone who's just living for the Lord. I'm just curious, where are you in your life right now? Are you a winner? Do you feel that sense of success and that sense of accomplishment spiritually? Are you growing and moving along in your spiritual life with Jesus Christ? Where are you? Well, look. If you feel that there can be some improvement, you're in the right chapter in the Bible. 2 Samuel chapter 5. It's the way of the winner we see in these few verses. Why is David considered one of Scripture's greatest winners? Well, there are three things that I want to share with you this morning about that question. First of all, we see in 2 Samuel chapter 5, that David is one of Scripture's greatest winners because David is a person that's absolutely clear about this. Relationships are important to the believer, even to mighty King David. I'm curious, have you ever experienced people who you thought they thought that you were against them. And it just took time and a little effort to convince them that all along that you had really been on your side. Because the reason I ask that question is I, I want you to know that's what's going on here at the beginning of 275. The Israelites, the elders of Israel, in the first couple of verses in chapter 5, thank God their eyes 
are finally open, that they can see clearly who David is. He's not their enemy. In fact, he's never been their enemy. And so there are a couple of things I want us to know at the head of this chapter. First of all, I want you to know the elders of Israel's recognition of their essential kinship with David. It says in verse 1 that they look at David, and this is what they say to him. They say, look, we are your bone. And they say to him, David, we are your very flesh. <coughs> and so in this confession and in this recognition, what they are essentially they're saying to David is that we're brethren. We're brothers. And despite all that's gone on in the past, all of the fighting, Saul, the rivalries, the stabbing in the backs, everything that's happened over all these years in the wilderness, they look at David and they say, look, we're brothers. We're brothers in the Lord. Sometimes I wonder if this little encounter here with the leaders of Israel, with David, in this passage, isn't the background of the, one of the most famous of all the Psalms, the 133rd, where in verse 1, sometime later, David would write this. He would say, Noah, brethren, how beautiful it is, how wonderful. When brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. And then he, he, he compares it to the anointing, the joy of the anointing oil that will flow down the beard of Aaron and anyone who knows the experience of this. There's the anointing of God. And so David sees in this moment, and they see in this moment, the essential kinship that there is between them and between David. You know, 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 says, For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free. And here's why. Because we have all been made to drink together of one spirit. And that is what makes us brothers and sisters in Jesus. There is an essential kinship between those that love Jesus Christ. But David recognizes this. We need to come together. We need to come together. Well, the elders recognize this in this moment. They see this. But the second thing that they see about David is that they not only recognize their essential kinship, but it also says that they recognize David's well-demonstrated loyalty to them all along. Now, we have seen this in our journey through 1st and 2nd Samuel over and over and over and over again. David is loyal. He's loyal to Saul and his family, and he's loyal to the children of Israel. And here, they now can clearly see the critical role that David has played to their success and to their future. In fact, they say something that just blows me out of the water. It's found in verse 2. They, they look to David and they say, you know, we finally figured this out. It was you, you did, who led out Israel and brought it in. Huh? What? Finally, they get it. He's not a get him. He's been for them. And everything that David has done has actually worked to the advancement of Israel. And they say to them, him at the very beginning, they say, look, we're brothers. By the way, one thing to note in passing, I don't want us to overlook before we move on into Samuel chapter 5, the choice that David makes in Jerusalem 
as there in capital Y. Why does he pick Jerusalem? So, like, what's wrong with Hebrew? He's been there for now. He's comfortable. He's all settled in the Hebrew. It must have been a wonderful place to live. Everybody's there. All of his family, all of his soldiers. It's a great place to have a capital. But in this United Kingdom, as David is looking as to where, how can he bring Israel and the tribes of the north into unity with the tribes of the south? David says, was my Hebrew brethren pack your bags. We're not going to have our capital in Hebrew. If there's going to be a united kingdom, we're going to go over the north to Jerusalem. And by so doing, these Israelite elders, they look back to David and they say, Are you serious? You're going to do that? You're going to leave the southern city of Hebrew, the place that you love, and, the, and you're going to move north and put Why are you doing that? You can almost see David look back at them and say, I want you to know something. I want us to come together. And if it means I've got to come north to put our capital, we're going to do that. So David's efforts to bring Conciliation. I want us to see this man is working hard. He wants the church to work. And as I have said to this congregation before, I will say it to you once again, now in the context of 275, if the kingdom of God does not work here, Where do we expect it to work in the other place? <coughs> this is the church. It is the place we are called upon to recognize our essential kinship and to always be working together for reconciliation. Tonight we're going to come back and look at this a little more. We're going to go back a little bit and look at David and Abner and how he treated them and how it informs 2 Samuel chapter 5. Why is this man truly one of Scripture's real winners? The first thing we learn is that his relationships with people are a priority. Okay, number two. The second reason that David is such a winner in our passage is because he's a man whose ego was in check by the Spirit. The second thing we learn as to why it is that David can be so used by God and therefore become so successful in life is that David has recognized that something has always got to put a check on this man's ego because if it doesn't happen, he's going to have a problem. I want you to know how David's unbroken record of success, both politically, militarily, meant as it's written in verse 10, it had brought to him more, it says more and more power. It says of David that he was becoming day by day, more and more and more powerful. When I was reading this passage for the first time several weeks ago, I was sort of thinking ahead to this morning, when I read verse 10, I kind of sat back in my chair in the office, and this is what I said to myself. It's a danger! Danger! Will Robinson. There's any millennials in here, they, they don't they talk about who's, who's Will Robinson. <laughs> you, you don't have to be a watch out! Becoming more and more and more powerful. Why is this a danger? Because it is just at this point where big problems with many a leader and many a person began right there. But the Spirit would not allow David to go down that rabbit hole. 
And there were two things that David had learned here from God. First of all, I want you to see how he had learned that every success that had ever come to his life, it was all because of God. Now that's the first thing that I think that so David. Every, almost every single time David has some sort of success, he says, well, maybe so, but you know why it was so, it was so, because it was all God. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Great thing <coughs> he has done. David had come to learn that the true source of every good, perfect gift that had come into his life it was not his personal competence. It was not by some sort of innate ingenuity. But instead, as he would write later in the 23rd Psalm, even though when times come when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear evil. Why? The reason that I never fear, Lord, it's because in each and every circumstance that I've ever faced, you have been with me. With you. You have been with me. So this morning, I got away a little late. I'm driving a little faster than I should have been driving on Kimbrough Road. I don't know, 55, 60 miles an hour, I go around the curb, and there's a Truth County Sheriff's Department coming up and my heart dropped and I cried out to the Lord, oh no! You know what happened? I like this Patron Road. I wish I knew who he was. Because he blinked his lights at me. <laughs> Turn around. You know what he was saying to me? He was, it was God saying, slow down, preacher. I went on past, I was looking at my rear view mirror, and I was saying, see, don't turn around, you never know. I, I just drove over the China Bichu River, just praising the Lord this morning. <laughs> to God be the glory. To God be the glory. Or as David makes clear in our lesson this morning, verse 10, it was because the Lord God Almighty was two things that David had learned. One, every success in his life was because of God. But the second thing he had learned is that everything he was called to do in life was strictly for the benefit and for the advancement of God's people. That's why he had been called. Not for the benefit and the aggrandizement of David. There was an unfortunate thing that happened last week on social media. I hate it when things like this occur. And it has to do with my, my colleagues. Some preacher somewhere got in front of his congregation on a Sunday morning and somebody was filming. <coughs> Because during the sermon, I don't know why my mother called me this time. Apparently this man had his, his heart set on getting some high-end, expensive watch. Like a Rolex or something. I don't know, one of these really expensive watches. And for some reason he decided that he was going to get in the pulpit that morning and sort of put the screws down on this church. <clears throat> and he was asking, what's wrong with you? Why don't y'all, I want the, you know I want it. Why haven't you gotten it for me yet? I told you I can take it as a gift. And look at here, arms still empty. <laughs> I love this guy. And I'm thinking to myself, what are you doing? First of all, why do you even want it? One. But secondly, to the church of Jesus Christ that you've been called upon to serve, you just decided that? Why are you there? Our lesson 
Israel's elders were apparently aware of a word of the Lord. We see this in verse, verse 2. We have no record of this, but we learn of this. They record it to David. In verse 2, they had apparently received a word from the Lord revealing that David was to quote, listen, shepherd my These words that they have received from the Lord, it must have been reassuring to the elders of Israel because it affirmed two things. First, that Israel was the Lord's possession. They're his, not David's, and no earthly king could own them. And I'm always Every now and then, not always, every now and then, the Holy Spirit checks my life. Because every now and then, when I'm talking to people about the First Baptist Church of Shana, occasionally I will use this language, unfortunately. I was like, oh, yeah, you're talking about my church. Stop there for a moment. My church, that phrase, can be the most innocent, innocuous phrase that you can think of. We may just be referring, we may be referring nothing more to the church than just referring to the church that we go to and say, and we call it my church. Great. But there can be a place, and this is particularly true when it comes to me and to preachers. That sometimes the Lord checks me and said, Chuck, did, what, what did you just say? I said, uh, I said, I said, I said that, that was something about my church. And he made a little sort of Okay, before we move on, let's just make one thing clear. My, in the English language, is possessive. It's a possessive word. And so, just to be clear, in 1 Corinthians, if you didn't learn it there, you can learn it in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel 5, but you can also go to the book of 1 Corinthians, where didn't I make it clear to you on that this field in which you serve is God's field, and this house in which you minister, I said there to Paul, it's not Peter's, it's not Paul's. It doesn't belong to a Paulus. But the house in which you serve is mine. God's house. God's field. God's Israel. God's people. It is the church of Jesus Christ. And in the church, the head of the church is who? It's not the pastor. The head of the church is God. Who is the pastor? The pastor is a member. A member who's gifted as a pastor and a shepherd, but no different than the giftedness of each member. Just members together of a body of which he is the head. And David and Israel, they understand something. They understand something. Israel was the Lord's possession and not David's. Well, I want you to know they also know that David's assigned role was that of a shepherd. That is, one who is appointed, who will defend, who will lead, who will tend to the needs of those he is responsible. Or as verse 12 puts it, everything that David was to do, verse 12, was, quote, for the sake of his people. Yes, but I was in Sydney. There was a church on the North Shore of Boston in Beverly, Massachusetts, where my daughter was born, called North Shore Community Church. 
still there. Great church. A lot of seminary professors, Old Testament, New Testament. Oh, great Sunday school classes. That was your life, right? And um, I didn't go there. I went to a Baptist church. Did everybody say amen? Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but in pastoral ministry, while I was in pastoral ministry class, Gordon McDonald, who taught the class, one day came in to our class and he handed out for us what was a job description. North Shore Community Church, this great congregation, was looking for a new pastor so their other pastor had retired. They were searching out for the next pastor and they put together a job description. And Gordon McDonald, who knew a lot of people at the Shore community, got a hold of it and brought it into our class. And he passed it out and said, Gentlemen, I want us to look at what it is that they're looking for in a preacher and a pastor of a church. Let's see what the requirements are. And the requirements that they were looking for in the pastor, in their pastor, was put in about 10 bullet points of things that they were looking for. And they were placed in their priority list. This was from a survey that was given to the church. What do you think the number one thing is that North Shore Community Church was looking for when they were searching for a new pastor? What was the number one thing that overwhelmingly came out from everybody in that church? What do you think? I like that, but that wasn't it. That could have been a contender. What else? Oh, I'm going to come back to that. It's worship. I'm not going to say it's worship. It's I'll tell you. The number one thing that they were looking for in a pastor is they wanted to make sure that they would get somebody who would. I don't, I haven't seen that on uh, Indeed. <laughs> For these job, job descriptions, the number one thing they wanted in the answer. They were looking for someone that they knew they could count on. That every day. That this man would be praying. Praying for them. Israel's elders, they come to this recognition that everything, everything that David is doing, it was for the sake of the people of Israel. That's why he did what he did. It wasn't for him, but it was for one, the glory of God, and number two, everything for the building up, as Paul would say, and the edification of the body of Jesus Christ. And that's why. That's why we serve. Why is David one of Scripture's greatest winners? His relationship with people, they were a priority. His ego is in check because of the spirit of work in his life. And then finally, number three, we see in our passage that David recognized that his problems were all God's for the soul. And then note in our lesson this morning, two things. One, I want you to know David's, what I call, steady as she goes, patience. This is one unbelievably patient man. Because here we are, after all this stuff before him, finally, David is anointed as king. of all of Israel. I want us to remember that this is the third anointing. Third. First is when he was a kid. Samuel in Bethlehem. First Samuel 16. Next, he's anointed a second time. Later. Not too far removed from this, but in Judah, by the elders of Judah. 2 Samuel chapter 2. David, 30 years of age. And now, 
after every. We see the anointing by the elders of Israel. <coughs> and although anointed to his position very early in life by Samuel, David here in 2 Samuel 5, although he could have, there were lots of trump cards he could have played on the elders of Israel. He could have played the trump, I'm the boss, I won the war. He could have he could have played the trump card, I've got the military, you don't. He could have played his trump, Abner's dead, you have no leadership. He could have played the trump, you have no leader, you have nothing. He could have done all that stuff. But he doesn't. And it's the most amazing thing that we find about David in this passage, it is in fact what I call his not doing. It's what he doesn't do that just blows me away. Because what we see is David here, he stands before the elders of Israel, and though he could have, if he wanted to, he could have dominated them. He could have conquered, he could have killed them, I guess, if he wanted to. No, no, not for David. Instead, it is his not doing of anything. Over all of these years, which in fact has left space and time for God to step in to every circumstance and move people here, move people there, Deal with the circumstance, God to step in and work. David's patience blows me away. He's waiting on the Lord. He's waiting on God's time. It is, in fact, his steady as she goes patience and trust in the will of God for his life that will eventually bring David to the fulfillment of his kingship. Well, secondly, it's not only his steady as she goes patience, but we know, I want you to know also David's regardless as it may be confidence that he has in the Lord. That he has in God and God's will for his life, he absolutely is trusting in the Lord. And so in 2 Samuel 5, we have two remarkable little phrases that I don't want you to one, I want you to note the word reference to God, to the Lord, as the Lord who breaks out. The Lord of the breaking out. Depending on your translation. It's a wonderful little phrase. What is it, what is it referring to? The Lord of the breaking out. Well, this is the circumstance. David now, the Philistines, they've heard that David has come into the power. They're probably thinking to themselves, we should have killed him when he was with us. But now that he's empowered, let's get him. And all of the Philistines, they gather. They're going to get him. But David, he comes to the Lord, prays to the Lord as the Philistines are amassing all around the city. And it says that as David goes out to the battle, that in the battle itself, who went with him? The Lord of the mighty mountain. That in the midst of the battle, in the midst of the problem, in the midst of the circumstance, in the midst of the trial, there's one thing that you can always depend upon, upon God. Is that He will be there with you. That when the going gets tough, the Lord is breaking out. You pray. Break out into this circumstance. I need you. That's what David did. He calls him. Lord of the breaking down. But secondly, he also calls him in verse 24, he calls him also the Lord who rustles in the treetops. That's a literal rendition of the Hebrew. The Lord who rustles in the treetops. Yesterday, I think it was, Brian and Rebecca, I don't know what got into them, some sort of some sort of dementia, some, I don't know, but they decided they were going to go on a hot air balloon. Why do people do these things? 
And even worse is yesterday early in the morning, he, they send us photographs as they are about to take off. And the first balloon with some, somebody in there, some, some victim, is taking off in this balloon. And Brian takes a photograph just as that balloon hits the treetops. I have the photo here. But it hit the treetops taking off. And, to, and I, I wrote him back, Jettison! I said, Jettison, don't get on that thing! <laughs> I guess in one way you can look at that picture and say, with the rustling of the treetops, that's not a good omen, is it? Why? Well, Lesson 275. The Philistines gather after their first woman and they show up again. They say, well, maybe we could get him the first time, we'll get him the second. And the Lord, David inquires of the Lord, and this is what the Lord says to him. He says, David, I don't want you to rush now into this battle. In fact, I'm going to give you a little strategy. Listen to me. You got your pen. I want you to go this way. I want you to kind of sneak around. He gives him this little strategy. It's really cool. He says to him, and then he says this to David, there's one thing you can count on, David. That when I find you, tell you to step out. You'll know that I'm talking to you. He says, because I want you to listen carefully. Then you hear the rustling of the trees. When the wind begins to blow through those treetops, that will be a sign for you. I'm there. I'm already there. I've gone ahead of you. And where the Lord of the breaking, breaking out is a sin is a picture of God in the midst of trial and circumstances, and we're kind of wondering what's happening when everything is falling apart. He says, steady, I'm there, I'm with you. I'm here. But in the Lord of the wrestling treetops, it's God's way of saying to you, I know you're worried about a lot of things in life, children, but I also want you to know that before you ever face anything in life, I've already been in it. I've already been there ahead of you. I'm working this thing up. I'm making it happen for you. And I think it is especially significant in our passage in David's defeat of the Philistines in 22 through 25. It says in verse 24, it says, it speaks of the Lord who had gone out Front, in front of David and his army. You know, this is an interesting passage because something's happening in 2 Samuel 5 that it's, it's, it's a change. It's a fairly significant change in everything that we have seen so far in 1 and 2 Samuel. And let me tell you why. Prior to this chapter, back from the very beginning when the elders of Israel had gone to Samuel, they said, we want us a king. We want us a king. And he looks back at them and he says, well, what do you want a king for? They look back to him and, him, and this is what they said to Samuel. We are looking for a king because we want one like all the other kings of the earth. Because when we go out to battle in the future, we want our king to go out in front of us and we'll fight. We want him to fight our battles for us, they said. And this has occurred in David, it's occurred in sickness in him. He demonstrates the reality there of that all throughout our study and second Samuel. But when we get to two Samuel 5, something different is going on. Did you know that? Because now the thing that we learn. In David and King David. Is that David now is saying, I want to give you something better than what you have asked for in the king. Because now when you see me, and when you see me as your king, let me tell you what I'm going to give you. I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to seek the Lord on. And I'm going to ask him when the times get tough for us. 
I have been a single born. We seek now to have an even greater king. We come to you. You go in front. You go in front of me. And you will fight all of our battles for us. But David knew that all of his problems were God's for the soul. How confident are you that God's going to take care of you? Where's your trust? Where are you in your walk with the Lord? Do you really trust him? Do you really have confidence in the midst of the problem that you are facing right now in your life, the biggest thing on the planet, whatever it is for you, are you going to come ask him? How confident are you that God's going to take care of you? That your problem is not yours. It is me. God's the God of the breaking up, the Lord of the listening truth is there to help and to guide your life. So Big Ten Revival, I'm a man who hides his feelings. I don't think I can keep from revealing all the things inside of me. They are out of control. So I'm letting go. There was a time things didn't matter, reason and rhyme or second nature. It was all a facade. I have come to know. So, Lord, I'm not know. I'm calling. Are you hearing me? I'm following. Come and catch me. From now on, I put my trust in you and you alone. So I'm letting go. I thought this morning we were when we were singing that hymn about the beauty of God. How beautiful is his name. How beautiful our Lord is. I don't know why I thought of this, because I haven't thought about it in probably 30 something years or more. But I was reminded of Orangeville High School when a revival Holy Spirit fall down upon it on the smoking area of that school where kids were allowed at that much to go out in those smoking areas where the Spirit of the living God fell out and a bunch of teenage hippies all of a sudden began carrying their Bibles to school Monday through Friday, talking about Jesus, and we couldn't wait to get out to the smoking area at lunch to tell others about the love of Jesus Christ. We would gather in the morning in a little store, a little shack, really, but it was a, it was a little store, not a pod. We would gather over there before school Monday through Friday, and we would pray together. That the Lord will be with us. One of my friends, her name is Rose Wall. Rose Wall's older brother was a drug dealer in town. She came from an awfully dysfunctional family, and the Lord had saved Rose. <clears throat> and one morning, Rose showed up at the little store. And the thing I remember most about Rose is she was carrying with her that day about half a dozen Bibles in her arm. She's had a whole bunch of Bibles. She just showed up. I said, hey, Rose. I said, what you doing with all the Bibles? She said, I'm going to to other people. And she was so cool. She was cool. So we left that place. I was one of the first to go. I walked across the street, went across the high school. And as I was walking toward the high school, I heard the screeching of, of tires in the car. I turned around, and all I saw were paper, a cloud of paper, just all in the area. And I, and I looked, and Rose is flipping in the air. She hits the ground with paper. 
and we go running to her with her feathers and nothing we could do. She wasn't alive. And the ambulance came and they took her off, and me and my brothers and my sisters. We were, I remember, I was just one, my God, what, why, what, what? And days went to weeks and weeks into about two or three months, and finally, after three months, Rose in the hospital. She was well enough to where guests could come in and see her. And I, I made my way to Beaumont, Texas, and I went up to her room where she was, and I pushed open the door and I walked inside. Rose looked at me, and she put on her face the most beautiful smile. And she let it back to see me. How cute. He helps us through the most difficult times and the biggest problems that we ever face in life in our life. Don't ever forget about the breaking out God who rustles in the treetops to let us know he's always there with us. No matter how difficult the trial or the problem, how confident are you? We know not what tomorrow holds for any of us today. I found out that this morning on Kim Row Road in Red Ridge, Georgia. You never know what's coming around any curve in life. But we trust in our God. Has He ever been unfaithful to you? Has He ever not gone with you? The most difficult troubles, says David. David comes to us and 2 Samuel chapter 5. He's a winner. He's a winner. He understands his brethren, how important they are to him. He understands how his ego, being careful, he's going to be in big trouble. So the Lord comes along and he checks us off. Aren't you glad? He does not. Then he is a person. He's a winner because he knows that every problem that he has in life, they are not his. That problem that you face today, that problem that you face today, that problem that you face, they are not yours. They are the Lord's. He's going to work it out. Well, Father, I thank you for this lesson this morning in this chapter. We pray. Holy Spirit, for your work in our life today. I pray that faith would arise, trust would arise, love for the brethren, humility of mind, the basics of our faith that can turn losers into winners. <coughs> I ask now, Holy Spirit, in these next few moments as we rededicate our lives to you, may we do so. May we do so. I ask in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me this morning? The altars are open. If you'd like to pray here, I'll pray with you. But pray. And ask for God to come and move in your hearts this morning as we respond now to the word of God. Again, play for us, Lord. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary.
place. We leave here today, I pray that that Bible be in something more than just ink on a page, but may it be power written upon our hearts, reminders that you were with us no matter what comes through the valley of the shadow of death. We fear you and you're with us. Thank you for that. Thank you for this church as we return here today to study more of the word back tonight for worship. We love you, Lord. I pray that we may love and serve you more faithfully every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's love each other, brethren. How good and how pleasant it is when brethren love each other and love each other.